Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome our live stream audience and also the audiences that listen to this later, either on our podcast or on our YouTube channel. Um, this is uh, one of over 600 programs we've done since the pandemic began. We'll be opening up to live audiences uh, fairly soon in San Francisco. Um, but so far, we've been trying to bring you uh, exactly what we've done for over 100 years in San Francisco, which is to discuss large topics in uh, politics, public affairs, but also uh, any author uh, that's bringing out a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, we love to have that as part of our whole um, platform of what we like uh, to present to you so that you can enjoy the intellectual stimulation that comes from new ideas. So today we have Nina Krauss. Uh, her book is uh, quite, uh, in a, uh, quite appropriately titled Of Sound Mind. Um, and she's going to give us an idea about what it's like. I mean, our minds are obviously visually oriented, uh, but we have five senses and uh, we, we uh, learn a lot from all the input. And we're going to talk about the science behind it and also the psychology behind it. So well, thank you very much, Nina, for joining us. I'm so um, glad to be here. Thank you. So uh, why don't we start with Helen Keller's uh, uh, observation? I think that that's a great place to start. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, you know, she, she said that um, sight connects us with things and sound connects us with others, with other living things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there, there have been experiments where, where, where people have taken polls of, you know, what, what is the favorite sense? Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that most people would much uh, prefer to uh, lose any sense other than their visual sense. Um, but I think that that is because um, hearing is under recognized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you started with this, George, because a, a, a core feature of sound is that it connects us. Mm -hmm. Sound is alive. And right now, you know, you and I, you and mm -hmm. I are talking and, uh, you know, we, we have this, uh, you know, what, what Ian McGilchrist calls betweenness, uh, <laughs> this, this very alive um, activity, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's improvised, it's in the moment, you and, you know, we're everyday improvisers, we don't have a script, mm -hmm. and yet you and I, we're, we're connecting and sound connects um, all of, of, of us humans, and it connects uh, other living things with other living things and the whole network of, of life. It's interesting. I just uh, came back from my 50th high school reunion. And I, I think uh, for those who, who attend any reunions, uh, haven't seen people for a long time, I think the easiest way to recognize people is to close your eyes and listen to their voice. Um, that actually you, you can recognize them much more easily than you can if you just see their faces. Um, obviously, the face helps them if, if you have any kind of memory of being able to progress people, etc. But it's, a, it's very funny. Um, and the visual cues, again, are very interesting because a lot of people think that all their classmates look younger than they actually are. Um, and the reason for it, I think, is because their visual cues are coming from the eyes and from the mouth. And this is these are the children that they grew up with and they see them as children, whereas somebody who didn't know them, then they just look at them and say, you know, that's that's a body that has aged appropriately for 68 years of age, that kind of thing. So um, I find that the oral cues there and it's a good you know, lead into your thing are are clearer, more, more clearly uh, indicative of who you're talking to, who you're dealing with. Um, have you found any of that in your research, you know, that, that people Very can much. recognize voices faster? Yeah, I mean, our, our sound mind makes us us, first mm -hmm. of all. 
Um, but, you know, you talk about the sound of the voice, you know, there, there's this expression that, oh, it's so good to hear the sound of your voice. Well, mm -hmm. it is really good to hear the sound of your voice because there's so much information there about you, about who you are, about your memory and just, um, you know, your, 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 your memories with that person. And I think that gets to um, the idea that I, I really um, discuss a lot in the book, which is that the sound mind is vast. And mm -hmm. really, if we step back for a minute, we think, um, you know, I, my, my point is that the hearing brain is vast. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think classically, when people think of, of hearing, first of all, they think that a lot of hearing happens in our ear, but mm -hmm. a lot of it happens, most of it happens in our brain. I mean, think of, of, of Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. Uh, so um, sound um, engages the, hear the hearing brain engages not just the classic auditory pathway also from ear to brain and back again, but it engages um, how we think. So our cognitive skills, and that includes our mm -hmm. memory. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it engages how we think, how we feel. And also there, you can see the intertwinedness, you know, mm -hmm. how um, our memories make us feel, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it engages how we think, how we feel, how we move. I mean, sound, sound is, is movement. It's the movement of, um, of, of air molecules. And, and, you know, one of the exciting things about sound is that it's dynamic. And, and, you know, I think again, one of the reasons that, um, people don't notice it as much is because, um, you know, sound is produced and then it's gone. You don't have this thing that you can that you can hold on to. But so the hearing brain engages how we think, how we feel, how we move and how we integrate the information mm -hmm. from the other senses. So our visual sense and what we smell and um, all, our touch, all of mm -hmm. our senses are, are deeply um, ingrained with how we hear so that the hearing brain, the sound mind is vast and much that I think much vaster than most of us um, are aware of. We want to, I want to go into the science of um, how we turn all, all of those. Uh, we, we feel that we're touching reality. We're never really touching reality uh, or hearing or we're, we're getting signals that, that our brain process turns into electricity and then is analyzed. But before we go into that, um, let's, let's talk about something that's very up to date, which is Tony Bennett, because uh, Tony Bennett was just on, on uh, 60 Minutes and he has Alzheimer's, and, but he, he can't carry on a conversation very easily, but he can get up and sing songs that he knows and believe. And now this has been around for a while. People have known this, you know, I mean, uh, I dealt with my own father 20 years ago about the same issue, but it being Tony Bennett, uh, and, and to see this uh, on TV where everybody can see and hear him switch from one way of thinking to another based upon his sound memory, I thought was sort of perfect timing for your program. Yeah. So why don't, why don't you talk a little bit? I, 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 did you see the program? I, I did. I did oh, okay. see the yeah. program, and, and it, it's really touching. And it speaks mm -hmm. to something that, that we really know quite well. But again, don't... Mm -hmm realize and don't appreciate music should be part of mainstream medicine mm -hmm. uh, certainly for memory disorders because um uh again sound sound has a very very direct link to our memory because we have to learn through sound if you think from from an evolutionary perspective um mm -hmm. organisms throughout history have had to make sense of sound and to disambiguate Oh, you know, I hear uh, the grass is moving, uh, but there is uh, a, a slight change in that movement of the grass that now signals a potential uh, mate or predator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is 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 this is this lunch or or what? <laughs> you know, but 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 and, or am I lunch? You know, right? And 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 you have to learn <laughs> this, and this is no. deeply learned. And um, and again, what I, I love to to think about the sound mind. 
Um, and, and really what is at the core of the book is how the things that we do again and again, like Tony Bennett, mm-hmm. are what make us us. And I, mm-hmm. I think, again, we, you know, we are so um, primed to think about what's happening in the moment. But really what makes us us is the experiences that we've had throughout our lives, how we have spent our time, which mm-hmm. is why I think that we have a huge responsibility to ourselves and our children and our uh, educational mm-hmm. system and our, our medical system to, um, to, to, to really think about what is the best way to be spending time. And a lot of the best ways, in my view, um, means engaging with sound. Uh, this is towards the end of your book, but we'll go there right now. But I, I, you, you mentioned about music as medicine, and you do mention in your book also that Pythagoras uh, used it exactly like that. He's known for his mathematics, but part of what he did uh, in music was he realized that there was a mathematical basis for the scale um, and is therefore responsible basically for the scales that we use in Western music. Um, and and he he wanted he used music as therapy for people as you mentioned, yeah. um, so it goes back that far. Um, but uh, but we we you know your research and other people's research in this area is showing that there's a real reason for this. Now you you mention a lot of things uh, that are you would suggest as part of the fact that we have a sound mind for uh, there to be a bigger emphasis on in education. And, and it was fascinating um, how much better musicians, for example, did on different tests. Um, so I think you, you mentioned bilingualism, uh, music, and uh, athletes. That, that was an interesting one. That, you, know, if, if you, you think how much information they have to take in uh, perfectly in order to catch the ball when they're looking in the other direction, turn around, catch the ball, and all that, all that kind of stuff. They're getting clue, cues from all over the place, and they are tightly attuned to that. So why don't you talk about those parts of what you think should be more educational, uh, without getting concussions, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and also, like the specialties. Uh, your husband sounds like he's particularly uh, sonically gifted, I have to say. Well, yeah, he's uh, a musician, and, and he yeah. is just, uh, it's, it's just wonderful to, to, to be living with, with, with that with that sound mind, um, <laughs> I'm so lucky to be able to hear the music that that he makes all the time. And, and actually, during the pandemic, um, you know, one of the things he does is is he teaches, and he's been you know teaching forty lessons through Zoom. Um, mm-hmm. And and so from time to time, I mean, we might even be hearing some some notes wafting in and out mm-hmm. of, of 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 our a sonic space and, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. I mean, this, the, this is the kind of sound that I'm very happy to have in my, in my sonic world. Yeah. Um, but let, let me, let me talk about uh, musicians and athletes and, and bilinguals. Mm-hmm. And, and also I, I don't want to mention to you, cause I know you are a deep thinker and a philosopher, you know, people have thought about the binding problem. Um, mm-hmm. and, right. And, you know, how is it that, we are able to combine information from so many different aspects of our lives. And, and I think we can really see this in, in the sound mind. Um, mm-hmm. and, and also biologically, you know, a lot of the action is actually happening in the midbrain, which is in the center of the action. And it's mm-hmm. getting information from every possible um, area of the brain and nervous system. Um, and, and, you know, this is part of the, the, the biological reason that, uh, that sound is, uh, such an important way of binding information mm-hmm. and the sound mind is, um, yeah. but, but with, so, uh, if, if I step back just for a, a minute and, and talk about sound ingredients and the fact that, you know, there are ingredients in sound like pitch and timing and timbre, um, that, that people don't usually think about, um, they, mm-hmm. they, you know, like for a visual object, you know, this thing has a, a color, a shape, a size, um, a certain feel to it. Um, and, and so people are very aware of visual ingredients, but sound ingredients are, um, are as many, and, but they're invisible, so we don't notice mm-hmm. them as much. And it turns out that a bilingual, a musician, 
and a um, an, an, an athlete um, strengthened different parts of um, the sonic information, the, the metaphor that I like to use and I use in the book, and I hope you enjoy the illustrations. I, I work mm -hmm. with, yeah. with an artist, uh, Katie Shelley, uh, in, in partnership with her. So there are 80 pictures in the book and mm -hmm. 40 of them she made and we, we kind of uh, went back and forth with, with each one. Um, but um, the, uh, the the mixing board is the, the you know the idea that we have all of these ingredients and then um, our sound mind will increase or reduce the faders on those mixing board on the mixing board of the different mm -hmm. ingredients based on our life in sound. Um, mm -hmm. is it, everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. I just have to make a little adjustment, but I, I'm, you go right ahead. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you can think about this, this mixing board with faders and with different faders being enhanced or reduced, very much dependent on our history and our life and sound, how we have spent our, our life making sense of sound. And so bilinguals um, need to be, um, they, they, you know, they, they have these, these, these two or three or four or five, how many languages you speak, systems in the brain that are always there. Um, and you need to be kind of switching from one to the other. So you get a very flexible mind. But it turns out that one of the ingredients that is really enhanced in the bilingual brain is the fundamental frequency mm -hmm. in sound. And, and that is very important for pitch. You know, like you, your voice um, is at a lower fundamental frequency than mine, and a child's mm -hmm. voice would be at a higher fundamental. And so, you know, you can imagine that the voice is very much something that uh, defines me or you as an auditory object, um, <laughs> yeah. right? That's what, Absolutely. you know, what the scientists call it. Um, uh, and, 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 uh, but, but bilinguals are especially good at, um, at, at processing, and we can see this objectively, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, we were able to put um, sensors on your scalp and actually measure the electricity that sound produces in anyone. And if you are a bilingual, the fundamental frequency, that fader is gonna be turned way up. Mm -hmm. If you're a musician, the faders for the harmonics, which are important, of course, for, for distinguishing a flute and a violin playing the same note, it's mm -hmm. the harmonics that tell you that, but the harmonics also enable us to distinguish a B from a D and a P. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this is it's, it's hugely important for language. And, 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 and I can tell you that the faders that are enhanced in musicians are exactly the same ones, or there's tremendous overlap between the musician brain and what you need for various language skills um, you know, be, be, because the harmonics, for example, are so important for, for reading, you know, making mm -hmm. the kinds of sound to meaning connections that you have to make in order to read. Um, so it's harmonics and timing, um, mm -hmm. timing on multiple time scales from microseconds to, you know, seconds and, and over time and, and rhythm. Um, and there's rhythm in language. Uh, so these are, you know, the faders for for, for rhythm and timing and harmonics are enhanced in the musician. And mm -hmm. then you have the athlete brain who, you know, so we, we're involved in an NIH funded study that um, is looking at all of our Northwestern elite division one athletes, all 500 mm -hmm. of them, and we're following them over five years. And so, you know, we wondered, would there be something um, special about the sound mind in the mm -hmm. elite athlete Mm -hmm. And what we discovered is that there was no difference in the processing of the sound ingredients that we looked at mm -hmm. compared to a, a, a person who a typical person who was not an athlete. So we didn't see the kind of enhancement that we saw in, say, bilinguals or in musicians. But what we saw is that the elite athlete had a very quiet brain 
Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, our, our, our nervous system, our brain is always on there. And you can think of a lot of the electricity happening because the currency of the nervous system, of course, is electricity. And there's a lot of static that mm -hmm. is going on. And that background static is reduced in the elite athlete. Consequently, um, the bilingual, the musician and the elite athlete all have enhanced sound processing, but they do it for biologically different reasons. The yeah. bilingual and the musician uh, enhance certain sound ingredients mm -hmm. and the uh, athlete enhances them all because there is less biological noise. I thought that was just fascinating. And I, I wondered because a lot of athletes actually have a lower uh, metabolism. I mean, their heart rate is usually lower at rest. Um, and I was wondering if that was also part of their quietness. Um, part of their in, internal noise but it, it it's a, a fascinating and, and no one would have predicted that conclusion um you know yeah as, that's as why science is reasons. so fun yeah yeah exactly <laughs> you know? it's nice nice yeah it's nice that when you go into science and trying to study something you're expecting one answer and you get a totally different one that that's illuminating um let's talk about pitch for a second there was a lot of information on pack in your summary there um one of the things i found interesting uh, was that mandarin has uh you know it has all these tones and so people who speak Mandarin are, are have an enhanced soundscape that most other people don't have because they don't have that tonal perception. And lots of people, of course, make fun of how it sounds uh, if they're not used to it. But it's extremely uh, clever way uh, to, to uh, enhance the amount of con information that you can convey with a smaller number of words. Um, I lived in Hong Kong for a year and a half many, many years ago, and uh, there was always talk about that, you know, about all the different tones and how impossible it is to learn a language that's based on that. But as you said, anything can actually be learned if you put your mind to it about, about learning these sounds. That's another thing I thought was fascinating, that you can learn to pay attention to things that you've never paid attention to uh, from a, a sonic point of view. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And, and what is wonderful, and again, such a testament to we are what we do, um, you know, babies are born with the potential to learn all of the world's languages, mm -hmm. but depending on the language that has a sound to meaning connection for that baby, um, you know, the, the potential for all the other languages is, is there, but um, gets diminished over time. And what is strengthened is um, the, 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 the sonic mind, the, so, the sound ingredients that are important for the language that you speak. And, and certainly if you speak a tone language, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are these, these dips and rises and movements um, of pitch within a syllable. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously in, in a language like English, we have uh, all kinds of changes in, in, in pitch. Like if mm -hmm. I'm just asking a question or a statement, mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. happening over a much longer time frame than a syllable like ma will mm -hmm. have um a, a, it, it can be spoken at it with a different pitch trajectory and have a different meaning mm -hmm. yeah it it was fascinating that you mentioned in the research because i had not read research like that before on language but i had come across the idea that that learning a language before you reach puberty is useful because you learn to make the sounds and, the, and therefore your larynx is, is uh, developed in a certain, the muscles in a certain way. And once you get through puberty, where our larynxes are all affected by going through puberty, it's harder to, 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 to uh, shift the muscles of the larynx in a way that can make those particular sounds in other languages that you've never run into before, um, harder to make, which it makes learning other languages harder after puberty. Now you're adding a totally new thing, or not totally new, but I mean, to me, it's new. Uh, idea that you you learn these sounds in your mind at, as a child, as a very young child, and if it's outside that range, that also makes it harder to to put it into your soundscape later on in your life. Yeah, absolutely, and and, and it, I think it's important, really, at, at any age, but you know, because the sound and the sound of of speaking, you know, when we're speaking, we're hearing ourselves, and so that coordination also between the mouth and the the vocal apparatus and what we hear. I mean, again, you know, I, I think there is just a much more holistic view of the senses um, that I'm um, fascinated by. Mm -hmm. And it's really different from, um, you know, it's, it's quite at odds from, you know, if, if you're a scientist 
like me, you see that there are different um, uh, meetings for the vision people and the hearing people and the emotion people and mm -hmm. the voice people and and you know even it, it, there are different institutes of health for you know, different um, um, body functions and yet there is so much more integration than um, than, than I think we're really quite a, generally aware of and 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 that mm -hmm. that's really just something that I, I um, am increasingly um, fascinated by and fascinated also by the fact that, um, you know, just even in terms of a continuum of, of, of living things, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's this idea philosophically of, of them and us mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that the plants and animals are, are kind of these, these lesser beings and, and, you know, us, you know, we're, we're sort of the su supreme homo sapiens. Um, and, and in fact, from a biological standpoint, um, you know, there, there's this tremendous continuity and, you know, plants and animals, trees, we all use sound, we all actually communicate, uh, often on, on uh, slower or faster time scales and visual scales, but the underlying biological principle, so here I'm speaking as a biologist, Mm -hmm. are are tremendously common and and you know these these other living things have capacities that way out you know outstrip what humans can do for all the plants that are listening i think you should <laughs> should talk about the the experiment where uh, the sound of water was played um under the roots of an of a plant at the right at the right um you know hertz and that made the plant grow its roots in the direction of the water. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. so this is Monica Galliano's work. Um, and you know, any plumber will tell you mm -hmm. that the roots of trees are gonna get into the pipes underground. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, we, we, we've observed this for a long time. Um, and it turns out that, that um, this, some of the cues that uh, the roots are responding to are sound, and mm -hmm. um, and it's you know there's a particular tuning at around one or two hundred hertz. Um, that's a frequency cycles per second. It's, it's actually kind of at, at about the, uh, the 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 frequency of a male voice, the fundamental frequency. Mm -hmm. um, but the the plants, the roots are. Um, tuned to go and to grow towards the direction of the sound. And so what um, Dr. Galliano did is she had uh, plants that, uh, that, that were, were grown um, in, 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 in a pot that could go in, the, the roots could go in various conditions, in, in various directions rather. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, on one side, she would have sound and on the other side, there would be no sound. And otherwise mm -hmm. the environment was identical um, and the roots would go towards the sound and not as much towards uh, the uh, direction where there was no sound. So mm -hmm. you know, clearly um, plants uh, respond to, 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 to sound and to vibration more than you know even you know for example um you know we're, we're talking about the birds and the bees so mm -hmm. the, the 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 um plants will release their pollen just to a bee that is buzzing at a particular frequency mm -hmm. so it's not you know they're going to be other insects flying around but this 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 organism, this biological organism, this plant, is able to detect it. You know, through through years of, of evolution, it has learned that this particular um, bee is going to be really good for for pollinating its its species. Mm -hmm. So it, it's um, I'm constantly um, surprised and um, amazed by how vast not only our uh, hearing brain is our sound mind, but our sonic world. 
Well, we look out at the world and we, we see, as you mentioned before, we look at it visually so much and we just think of physical objects and stuff like that. But, but we're really taking in three of our senses, uh, touch and hearing and seeing are all based on different vibratory uh, abilities that we're reaching, that are reaching us. And, and the world looks completely different if you're not looking at the objects, but you're just looking at all the photons, all the radiation or all the motion, all the waves that are going on. Um, and it's clear to everybody that plants are taking cues from the sunshine. You know, they, they, that, that's, that's been clear for thousands and thousands of years. Everyone knows the plants follow the sun in, in order to maximize their exposure to the sun rays. Um, and that's also a, a, a reaction to, to vibration or, 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 or to, to waves. Yeah. So we, we, we like a, just a big picture thing about our, our senses. So we have these three senses, the other two, uh, sense of smell and sense of touch, I mean, sense of smell and sense of, sense of uh, taste are based upon chemicals, upon molecules that, that come in and are, they're, they're turned into electrical signals that are sent to our brain. The other three are all different kinds of vibrational uh, experiences that are then transformed by our nerves in, or into our nerves for electrical signals to our brain and somehow sorted out. Um, that's a very uh, big way of saying it. Do you want to put in some of the details? <laughs> well, I mean, I wish I, I, I wish I had, I wish I had more answers. Um, you know, we want to know. Um, and, and my students are always asking me for the answer. And, and first of all, it's not religion class. I, I, I think that's right. I think that we, um, you know, there, there's so much that we, we don't. That we don't know and, right. and i think that it's really important for scientists to to appreciate that and it's also important i mean again with my students when they ask for the answer the answer is almost always it depends mm -hmm. because context context is 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 going to matter um but you asked you know also how, you know, what, what is going on in the brain and and my one of the chapters in in my book is called the quest Mm -hmm. And uh, and and so for decades, you know, my group, uh, we call ourselves Brain Volts, and I, mm -hmm. I hope that people will go to our website, which is a labor of love. Um, but we have tried to figure out how to measure sound processing in the brain in a way, <coughs> excuse me, in a way that captures this holistic nature of sound processing. Mm -hmm. And um, we know we have been able to do this uh, with a, a particular response called the frequency following response, which uh, gathers information from the, um, the whole sound mind or hearing brain. It gathers information from our cognitive sensory motor and reward networks, from our senses, from our ears um, and eyes and uh, our experience, how we, we feel ab about um, um, about the sounds. And this is uh, sculpted over time. And, and again, we can, as biologists, we can measure individual neuron responses and see how they change with experience. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of, of you know, this, this um, brain response that we measure, this frequency following response, I like to think of it as a snapshot of um, sound processing and a snapshot of the sound mind and a lot of the um information is um is being processed in the midbrain mm -hmm. which is a great title for something that's in in, in the middle of the action <laughs> um it's not just it's not you know everybody wants to know where something is happening it's mm -hmm. not happening in the midbrain, the midbrain is just an important generating source for the sonic information that we can, uh, that is then revealed on the scalp. But importantly, because it's in the middle of the action, it, it has, it, it reflects information from many, many, many parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so I think that we can really, we really are beginning to understand um, biologically, what some of the mechanisms are, and, and we think we talk about um, 
um, afferent and efferent pathways. So they're oh, afferent pathways yeah. that, that, that take information from our ear to our brain or really from any uh, organ, afferent, you know, to the heart, efferent or efferent is oh. away from. Mm-hmm. But you can think of the ear to brain pathway, and that has been the classical auditory pathway that's been studied for years. Turns out the efferent or efferent pathway mm-hmm. is um, taking information from various parts of the brain and feeding it back to um, within the brain all the way out to the ear. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the ear is hearing the brain and we know from an evolutionary standpoint that the efferent system, the efferent system is, um, is more massive than mm-hmm. the pathways going upstairs. And mm-hmm. also with increased evolutionary um, development, the more um, complex an organism is and the more able that organism is to learn and to be modified by experience, the greater uh, you know, so the efferent system is really the, the special sauce that makes learning possible. And so, again, we are learning about how uh, this feedback from the efferent system, which we can measure with, you know, neurons mm-hmm. actually within the, the brain and experimental animals. And we can see how um, information from the efferent system then modifies information in the afferent system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that our default processing, you know, if somebody says knee, as in Nina, I was in a boxing Mm -hmm. class and every time they said knee, it was, um, (laughs) you know, you you learn, you know, certain things are are just, you know, are are just default, are inherent, are automatic because you've learned. So I'm saying, by example, that my afferent system now um, responds to knee um, in, in a very efficient way because of all of the efferent processing that has uh, led up to that all throughout my life, all of that experience. You know, it's, uh, you just mentioned it, and at the risk of, of giving away the, uh, the, the uh, not-so-secret information that we're all narcissists, um, you, there's this party uh, effect. You know, you're at a big party, and there's like 10 different groups of people chatting, um, and you're listening to the conversation of the group that you're in. But if someone mentions your name three groups over, y- you hear it. Uh, maybe not every single time, but often. And uh, it's, it's interesting because it must mean that all the sounds of all the conversations are making their way, you know, at, in a certain way or another, into your ears and into your brain and being ignored as unimportant. And, and so, so, as you call it, pruning, the pruning of the sounds must be the most amount of work that's being done because there's, there's a tremendous more amount of sound coming into your head than you pay attention. That's so right. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Because it's fascinating. Almost everybody has had that experience of, of suddenly hearing something from far away because it's your name. Yeah, and, and actually you can hear something else which is um, that, that you're not aware of, which is silence. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we've all had the experience of you know, the, the truck outside uh, that's been idling and making a lot of noise, it turns off, cuts the ignition. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, I mean, you hadn't noticed that that truck was there. Mm-hmm. It was there all the time. Mm-hmm. And suddenly the sound comes off and you react. You go. <sighs> yeah. And so there is so much sound and um the absence of it, the presence and absence of sound is something that we are very attuned to and very specifically attuned to in terms of um, what we learn to pay attention to. Uh, you know, you mentioned my, my, my husband, who's a, a musician. Um, uh, I, 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 I play some music and um, as I was learning a particular uh, guitar lick. Um, I was just wondering, you know, how how do I get my fingers to move um, so quickly? I, like I, I thought it was something that I needed to do with my picking hand to mm-hmm. get these notes to, to to just fly out in rapid succession. My husband comes by and he says, Nina, if if you would listen, 
you would hear the distinctive sound of a pull off, which is actually you're using your left hand and pulling off the strings very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and that enables you to make different sounds very, very quickly in a way that is not possible with your picking hand. And, mm -hmm. but it has a particular sound, mm -hmm. but you have to learn to pay attention to it first. So I was deaf to that sound until my husband came around and mm -hmm. pointed it out to me and I listened and I, um, you know, made these sound to meaning connections and also tried to, you know, with, through my body, tried to resolve the physical complexities of making those sounds mm -hmm. and listening to them and getting that feedback. Um, you know, you can just see my afferent and efferent systems working. But now when I hear that, um, you know, I, I, I know what it is. Mm -hmm. And and I I can do that. Oh yeah, I know what to do. Because you I have a line in your book. Att att yeah, attention is the holy grail. You know, and uh, you know, from a philosophical point of view about the mind, it's really a, a kind of a very interesting statement that the that the, you know, how what you're paying attention to is crucial to what you do with all the information that you're bringing in. You're in a, you're in a sea of information, but you pay attention to a very small part of it, and how you make those decisions is interesting. And one of my favorite examples is you, you're, you're driving down the highway and you're listening to the radio and you, one of your favorite songs is on and you're singing along to the song and stuff like that. And then ahead of you, you see uh, somebody driving crazily and, 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 and almost causing an accident. You're paying attention to that. Is it, do I have to stop? Do I have to pull over? You know, what do I have to do about this situation? So you're paying attention to that for about, say, 15 seconds. It resolves. The crazy driver doesn't hit anybody. And, and uh, so it calms down. And suddenly as it calms down, you realize that the radio is still on, the, the song, music is still playing, and you did not hear that, even though it's your favorite song, for 15 seconds or so. It, it was totally blocked out of your awareness, even though you know that your ears are hearing it. Yeah. No, but your attention, whatever controls your attention, is saying that's not interesting right now. Right, which is why uh, how we direct our attention mm -hmm. is so important and such an important responsibility again, mm -hmm. for all of us, you know, do we want to be paying attention to, um, to, to, to plinging things? Uh, do we want to be, you know, paying attention to screens all the time? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there yeah. are obvious advantages as we can see right yeah. now, but, um, you, you know, I, I think that, um, how we spend our time and consequently our attention, mm -hmm so um changes us biologically and, and i really go through that you know for those who mm -hmm. have the patience to 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 read through the the biology i'm, I'm not just saying this you know there right. are you know and in fact uh 20 of the book is mm -hmm. is references you know for anybody who wants to um get a little bit more information or but also just mostly to make the point that I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm not just yeah. saying, well, this is how I think it is. This is how converging evidence from multiple studies and labs and thinkers um, think it works. And I'm putting it together in, in, in this way. Um, and so I, I really, I talk about attention a great deal and mm -hmm. what that does to us biologically. So, you know, we understand some of these mechanisms, I think quite well and how at every part of the hearing brain, you know, cortically, um, in, the, in, in the thalamus, in the brainstem, um, in the ear, there are, you know, when, when, when you go in there with uh, microelectrodes and you measure responses to sounds that are either paid attention to or not, or that have some meaning uh, to the animal, you can really see how attention uh, changes the response in the moment and changes the responses um, in the future in a way that uh, then um, I think begs us to be mindful mm -hmm. about where and how we direct our attention. Yeah, and I think it'd be good to mention it, not important for our young adult listeners, but for those who are our age, um, if you stop paying attention to brain science and research back when you were a teenager or in college, 
um, there's been a big shift in, in ideas. Some of the ideas that were considered absolutely crucial, like left brain, right brain split, and, and, and the, the brain is hardwired for different things. Those, those ideas are pretty much long gone. Um, and the, the, the research has shown the brain is much more plastic um, in, in terms of how it, the different parts of it can be used, even though it is specialized. But, but uh, if something goes wrong with some of the special areas, other areas can often take over if not all, at least a, a portion of that, so. Yeah, and, and when, when many things go right, uh, changes are being made, so. Yeah, um, and, yeah. and you're, so, so one thing uh, that's useful is, is some of the ideas that you had for how to, you know, for example, delay dementia um, in people has to do with music education. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? I mean, almost everybody is interested in keeping that as far away as possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, uh, again, the, the, the science has shown that, that people who speak another language, I think because of the inherent cognitive flexibility that is uh, involved in speaking that other language, that that can delay uh, the onset of dementia. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that disconnects us from the world is our increased inability to hear people talking to us in noisy situations. And um, that can get increasingly, I mean, it's hard for anybody at any time in their lives, but as we get older, it becomes increasingly difficult. Um, it turns out that auditory experts, you know, for example, musicians, and when I talk about a musician, I'm, I'm talking about somebody who regularly plays music. I'm not talking about a professional musician at mm -hmm. all. Um, so, you know, we've learned that that musicians are simply better at uh, picking out sounds and sentences and relevant information in background noise. And, and we see this across the lifespan, but we see this, say, in an older adult who mm -hmm. has a typical um, older person hearing loss, so some hearing, some presbycusis, some hearing loss on the higher frequencies. And if you match two older adults with a presbycusic hearing loss, um, and one has a, a, a life of, of making, regularly making music, and the other mm -hmm. does not, uh, the person who has been making music throughout their lives, um, or even just for parts of their lives, because there's a legacy, mm -hmm. um, right. that, that, that uh, the ability to um, hear speech and noise is improved. So, you know, this is really important for, um, you know, the, again, the, the connection between sound and our cognitive skills. Actually, if, if, if we lose our hearing, um, mm. you know, we're, again, there have been studies showing that um, one, uh, it diminishes one's ability to think because you know, you, you, you have to, be, again, the, the, the hearing brain um, mm -hmm. engages how we, th we think. And mm -hmm. if you are not hearing the sounds, then you are not engaging with other people and you're not thinking as efficiently because um, that connection, sound connects us, that connection mm -hmm. with sound and the world is diminished. Yeah, your thinking is just silent, you know, talking. Um, you, 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 somehow the sound is in your mind. And for those who, who uh, you know, are, are a little less emotionally restrained, uh, the words come out of their mouth anyway. What, whatever they're thinking, uh, the words come out of their mouth, either when they're asleep or when they're walking down the street, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of situation. Um, but um, it, it's interesting that you... We, we, we have these different ways of trying to understand what's going on in our thoughts, in our minds, as we age. Um, but there are ways, as you said, that you can get over, you can, you can overcome the disabilities, the physical disabilities with mental skills. So uh, no, one, no one who's over 60 is going to become a major athlete or an elite athlete at that point. That, that doesn't work. But... Um, but you can resurrect your bilingual skills. You can resurrect your music skills and, 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 and practice them. Or start and, them. Or start or them. Start and, them. And, yeah. and again, you know, we don't have to be thinking about 
um, about about perfection and about the elite yeah. athlete. You know, movement, moving at any age, and it could mm -hmm. be walking around the block a few times. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing that, um, I, I, I there's there's actually plenty of of research that will show that 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 your thinking ability is better if you're physically active. Yeah, and, and the same goes for um, you know even if you've never played a musical instrument um it's never too late to start mm -hmm. uh, you know you, you probably are, are are it just doesn't matter mm -hmm. um how and and that's another thing that that we've shown biologically and others have shown um is is that it really doesn't matter how good you are um, what is much more important in terms of tuning the sound mind and every sound mind will be tuned. Mm -hmm. um, if, 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 if you're a, a beginning musician, you are going to be impacting your sound mind. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Very important. So You've been at Brain Volts for how many years? Three decades or so? Yeah. yeah. So what was the research uh, outcome that surprised you the most? Or, or, or it doesn't have to be the absolute most, but what, what comes to your mind is saying, boy, I wasn't expecting that answer sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, so many times. But I yeah. mean, one of the things that, that made an impression on me was very early on, um, I was measuring the single neuron responses while mm -hmm. an animal learned a tone signaled task. Mm -hmm. So the animal um, learned that uh, when a tone came on, a certain reward was going to happen or not. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating to see firsthand that you have this in individual neuron. So you're measuring the electricity from this individual neuron. The sound is the same. The animal is the same. Mm -hmm. But once the animal has learned that the sound has meaning, the neuron will fire differently to that same sound. Mm -hmm. And and that was just a, um, it, it, it just kind of hit me over the head of, well, mm -hmm. look, this is the, the, clearly the, the brain changes mm -hmm. and the brain changes with experience. We can see, see this on an individual cell level, this must be happening a billion times over throughout our whole nervous system. So, mm -hmm. so that, that made a huge impression on me. Um, it also made an impression on me, uh, you know, increasingly we've been um, interested in rhythm mm -hmm. and the idea of um, you know, people think about rhythm, you think about music, but there's so much rhythm in speech. Mm -hmm. Rhythm in speech is tremendously important. And, and again, um, the research has shown that many uh, you know, kids who have difficulty learning to read or with language skills have, have um, difficulties following a beat or with various rhythm skills. So we've, we've been looking into um, rhythm skills and the, um, you know, what, what is happening to the brain's response uh, to sound mm -hmm. and people who have this skill or that skill. And we, um, so we had a, a, a whole suite of, of rhythm skills. Mm -hmm. And if you would have asked me at the beginning, um, if you're good at one task, are you likely to be good at another? Mm -hmm. And and I would have answered, yeah, you know, you're just good at rhythm. Um, but it you know turns out that once again I was wrong, and uh -huh. I'm wrong all the time, um, <laughs> and I'm so comfortable with it, you know, because, um, and, and, and so you know I was just delighted to learn that um, you can't predict how good a, a job a person is going to do following just the beat to music, mm -hmm. and following a rhythmic pattern. Like if I say, and then you have to copy that, uh -huh. um, you know, don't ask me to do that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a rhythmic pattern. Right. And, and these are two very, very different skills. And it, you know, people had known for some time that 
you know, with with um, brain tumors and lesions that 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 sometimes these skills could be dissociated. It turns out they're dissociated in all of us. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that that fascinates me is that I like to think about, you know, how music is so important um, for learning both of these skills, because if Mm -hmm. you look at the time signature, that tells you something about the beat. It tells you where the one is, you know, one, two, three, four, one, you know, it's four, four time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the note durations and rests, those are the rhythmic patterns. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, if you learn those patterns and you, and you're doing this simultaneously at the same time, you're keeping track of the beat, um, you know, that's, a, again, another way of understanding why making music would help our language skills. Well, it's pretty clear, too, uh, just from the past, if you just say, um, is it easier to memorize a paragraph or a poem or a song? You know, so, so the, each one, is, the song has the most rhythm to it and, 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 and other musical beat cues and stuff like that. Um, and a poem, especially if it's uh, with a set uh, rhythm and stuff like that, is not free verse. It's just as uh, you know useful in memorizing. And so, if you go back a couple thousand years, people, of course, they, they just memorized long poems. They didn't memorize prose. Uh, nobody, nobody could memorize uh, ten thousand lines of prose, but ten thousand lines of of poetry had, had, was done by lots of children that were you know learning. Uh, in the schools where that, that was the emphasis. I mean, that doesn't and history for... was, was brought down that way, right? Right, exactly. The stories are brought down that the way. The bards. Yeah. So, um, and, and today, if you just look at today, if you ask people, you know, what have you memorized that you can, that you can tell me? A lot of people would say, I haven't memorized anything. And then you say, what are the, what, what are the words to your favorite song? Or, or, or sing your favorite song? And almost all you know, people would have some songs that even if they can't sing, they can they can kind of fake sing and, and, and do the words that go to it because of the of the emotional elements plus the rhythm that, that are involved in that process. Yeah. yeah, but but I think that that more emphasis on on memory and and you know what our parents and parents parents had to do in school in terms mm. of you know my, my mom was Italian and she had to uh, they, they they of course learned a lot of, of Dante and Dante, uh, yes. you know, they, they had to. <laughs> Um, you know, as, as a little school kids really recite, um, you know, parts of, of the Divine Comedy, mm-hmm. and and I, I think that I think that engages a lot of the sound mind, and and we're losing some strength there by not doing activities like that. You know, now you know if you want to know, well, you know, what did what did Virgil say? You know, you, you look it up. Yeah, right. Um, you know, you whereas, right away. you know, and, 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 but there's really something to, and, and, and also, I think just even in terms of our memory skills in general, I, I, I think that it's really, you know, that, that idea of racking your brain for what, what was the name of that song? Yeah. Um, you know, where, where did I see this? And, you know, just to look it up is, um, is depriving your brain of exercise. Well, you know, when you mentioned uh, the children, school children uh, learning Dante, you know, of course, that was also useful for other things, especially if they learn the verses of, of how, you know, what's going to happen to you in hell if you don't behave yourself in class, you know. <laughs> That's, uh, all right. Well, we have we have a few questions from the audience that I thought, you know, we, we could ask here. Um, Mary Eisenson asks, how do we teach people to actively listen like this? What, 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 what kind of processes do you have to do that? Yeah. Well, I think engaging in um, activities like that, that, that um, engage, make, make you really focus and pay attention to sound mm-hmm. with your whole being, like making music, learning another language, being a sound engineer, being a bird watcher, um, mm-hmm. being aware of, of sounds in, in nature, and also uh, respecting sound, honoring sound so that you uh, create for yourself and for your children and your um, society, if you will, a sonic environment that is not noisy mm-hmm. so that, um, you know, we, we aren't impeded in 
learning about sound because you you know you you just can't hear it because you know and, and I think you know people are very cavalier about um, the, the the sounds and the noises that we put up with and mm -hmm. I think that we can just ask ourselves I mean many things are are necessary but other things are not you know is it necessary you know, you're at an airport and planes are noisy conveyor belts are noisy is it necessary to hear the boarding pass scanned the 223 times for every passenger? Beep, 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 beep. That, that's not, you know, but, but people don't even realize that that is contributing to their, um, you know, they're in, in a constant state of alarm because sound is our alerting sense. So there's a lot that we can do. And it's tough enough for the passengers going through, but the people who work there are all day long. It's, it, it's got to invade their dreams. It's the same thing I feel about checkouts at the, at the who work at the it's grocery store. It's just unnecessary. Store. Sounds are all over, over the place. Yeah. I um, think there should be but, fines for, for burglar alarms. <laughs> you, you mentioned, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you mentioned briefly, yeah, it's probably more expensive to us to, to, to hear the alert, alarm than to just let the theft take place. Um, so you mentioned something about bird songs, and I have two things I wanted you to talk about from that. One is the owl story we, we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and the other is the larynx syrinx uh, difference. I thought that was fascinating. So why, why don't you tell the story about the owl and then tell about how birds do things slightly differently and that they uh, evolutionarily are totally independent, the syrinx and the larynx, which I, I think is also interesting because it means sound is so much more valuable that, that independently this will happen in different places. Yeah. Well, the owl story is just a great uh, story for how the brain changes with experience mm -hmm. because owls are, you know, they're nocturnal animals and they uh, really depend on sound for uh, their survival. And so they have a, a very, very good um, auditory hearing brain. Um, and they, this has been studied very, very carefully by uh, neuroscientists who have uh, measured sound processing in various parts of the owl brain. And um, long story short, you know, the, um, well, the owl will respond to sounds that are occurring at particular parts in space because the owl has a, an auditory spatial, visual spatial map of um, sounds of their soundscape. And what you can do, and this, so we know, I mean, the first thing that, that the scientists did is that they, they learned that owls have this very detailed um, auditory visual map. And then you can put prisms on the animal's eyes that will shift their visual field, say 30 degrees to the right or to the left, or somehow change the visual field so that they're not getting the same cues and aligning the auditory and visual information. And so now when you go into the brain and you look at the individual neurons, you find that the, um, the, the maps in time will shift to this new input that the animal is getting. And, and it, again, you know, the, the lesson to be learned here is that if you change the visual input or you change the auditory input, the brain will change. There are consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and also, you know, it, it so if, if, if a kid has an ear infection or if, if, um, you know, again, this has been shown in a lot of experiments with ferrets, if you plug one ear, uh, you know, what happens to the mapping of sound along different parts of the hearing brain and, and, you know, there are consequences. And then if you remove the plug or if you remove the ear, um, the, uh, goggles, um, the animal will eventually learn to, um, to again, to, to, to readjust. But mm -hmm. I think that the, the point is that throughout our lives, our brain will change based on our experience. And, you know, and the other thing that we learned with the owl is, you know, people ask, well, is it, um, are, am, am I too old to learn? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the the short answer is no and you know in every study that has been done um you know you can see that the neurons in the brain will change with experience until the the animal dies mm -hmm. um and again they show this with the with the owls showing that um 
initially when, when they did the experiments with the prisms on older animals, the older animals were having a hard time learning the task. Mm -hmm. But then they figured out that if they just shifted the visual field a little bit more gradually for the older animals, so in other words, used a different strategy, mm -hmm. the older animals look, learned just as well and just as fast. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of also, you know, knowing and understanding, not only do we learn differently when we're older and younger, but each one of us, and that's one of the things that, um, again, you ask, you know, what, what astounds me. So what, mm -hmm. you know, what we are able to do is we can measure sound processing in the brain with this electricity, and then we can play it back. So I can hear how your brain responds to say a particular sound or like a Beatles song. Mm -hmm. um, and what is fascinating to me was to just to, you know, to be able to hear how three healthy brains hear the world differently. We all mm -hmm. hear the world differently. And this is because um, throughout our lives, our uh, sound mind is, is just so active and alive and, and, and um, dynamic and changes with, with experience. Do I have time to talk about birds or? We're gonna, we'll, we'll end up with the syrinx and the larynx uh, last, but I wanna make sure that I get one question in here before. Um, uh, Heather mentions uh, when we're talking about uh, picking out words in, in, in a crowd, this is most obvious to me when any child says mom in the grocery store. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Everyone, everyone understands that one. Um, oh, I, I love that. It, 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 it's, it's so true. You know, even yeah. today, I mean, my kids are, you know, between 30 and 40 years old. And, and if I'm in a grocery store and I hear a kid crying, first thing, not my kid. No. <laughs> And uh, someone uh, named uh, Sam asks, um, I have attention deficit disorder. Um, I'm often getting a lot of information from the visual. Is this an adaptation or something different? In other words, uh, switching with uh, attention deficit disorder, do you think that that's not your area of study? So, uh, but, but does, it, does, it, does it switch more to the visual cues? No, I, I really think that, um, you know, again, just like the, the right, left brain simplific oversimplification right there's an oversimplification and this visual auditory learning is also an oversimplification because um there it's just way more that 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 just, just doesn't work that way mm -hmm. um um and and i encourage sam to mm -hmm. to read a book called rethinking thought by laura, laura otis um uh -huh. who um Kind of started with that premise of audit, are there auditory and visual learners and she uh, asked 30 very um, different and talented people um, how they thought and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really quite revealing and fascinating first of all how people think very very differently with combinations of of hearing and seeing and how uh, you know so many things that you wouldn't think like a, a, a visual artist uh, actually is much more uh, responsive to, uh, to, to to sonic cues and mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's and 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 to me I, I read it as as a um, it it really showed in individual people um, how interactive our senses and interconnected our senses are much more than this dichotomy that we are always searching for. Right, right, right. Um, it, it, in a lot of fields, it's, it's, we've come closer and closer to that viewpoint. I mean, that there are, there's a, like a spectrum of abilities and, and, and perceptions, and there's great similarities into how we all do this. But because it's all nuanced down to such fine details, that, that we all have a different landscape of, uh, which is why we all have different personality of, Sort of what percentage of each thing is is influencing what's going on, and that shifts over time too. But uh, yeah. our emotional landscape is very similar. We all have the same emotions basically, but some spend a lot of more time in anger than other ones do, and others spend a lot more time in love than other, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's it's yeah. a well, it, that's it, why it was all individual. It was also so important, and you know, you asked me about uh, you know what surprised me and what is important to me in in science is to be able to not only get an idea of what certain 
groups of people do, you know, mm -hmm. people you might call musicians or bilinguals. So yeah, you can make certain um, uh, generalizations, but what mm -hmm. you really want to know is how uh, Tony and George and mm -hmm. Nina, you know, you want to know how do individual people process these sounds and, you know, view that in the context of what we know about um, general principles. As you say, science is, is sort of getting started. We're, we're, we're only a couple hundred years into really uh, putting that much attention on it. Um, and the same thing is true in medicine. You know, we might know two or three percent. Um, and, and obviously the goal is exactly the same. How do you get as many general principles as possible and then apply them to each individual individually in the most effective way possible? And that obviously is going to require a great deal of, of computer memory to help us. No, it's not going to be done ever by a computer. We are not <laughs> the, the the brain computer analogy is not one that I. I That's why I said that you don't like that one. <clears throat> so, and, yeah, you don't like but, that one. So now tell tell us why the brain and the computer are not the same. Why well, it's a bad and why it's a bad analogy. Well, well, you know, we are not a collection of and as people, we're not a collection of um, um, uh, of interchangeable parts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and the computers work by entirely different strategies. If you just think about a, a chess game, you know, a, a computer will, will play chess, play chess mm -hmm. by going through billions of, of combinations. Is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Mm -hmm. Is it this? You know, that's how we have to now spend our lives on mm -hmm. hold, you know, or not on hold, but on these menus. You know, press right. two if it's this, press three, because you know, there's there's a computer that can't understand some something that would take you two sentences to explain. Right. But you have to go through these things because that's how computers work. Whereas a person playing chess is an experienced chess player is going to be looking at the board and then trying to arbitrate between a handful of moves. It, it, it's it, it's it's entirely um, different. I always love it when scientists come to that conclusion, um, because uh, you know, it, to me, when people talk about it, I mean, they talk about like our, our Zoom conferences and, and, and Zoom lectures instead of in person. It's like live theater. You know, people thought live theater would disappear when the movies came along or television came along, and certainly it had an impact on how much live theater there was. But there is nothing that replaces live theater because there are people there. You know, individual people, personalities, uh, you know, taking art through their personalities and expressing to other people. And uh, the same thing will be true about lectures, um, but, but this digital version isn't so bad. It's not, I mean, it, it's not a bad substitute, but it's always going to be a weak substitute. And there's going to be, I uh, uh, find that entertaining because there's a sort of Silicon Valley uh, sideline where people are hoping to be able to upload their personalities into, compu into computers and all become one with this big computer singularity. Um, and I have no idea why that sounds popular uh, or, or, or attractive. Um, but in any case, one last thing, because I, I really want everyone to hear this, and that's about the difference between the larynx and the syrinx. You said that there are several animals who are vocal learners. You know, humans are not the only ones. There are uh, songbirds, some songbirds that do it, sea lions and elephants. You mentioned those. But the, the birds, uh, you know, have a different different ability to create sound than we do. So why don't you tell about that? Yeah, well, as humans, we have one vocal um, uh, folds, uh, at, at one larynx that, that mm -hmm. contains our, our vocal folds, um, where the air is, is coming from our lungs and then vibrating the vocal folds to produce the sound. And in birds, they have what's called a syrinx, and they have two um, sets of, of, of uh, vocal, of larynxes, if you will. And it, mm. it's called the syrinx and it operates very much like a larynx. But what is really very cool about it is that, um, you know, like the bird can sing a duet with itself. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we, we can't. <laughs> and it's, it's located right where the trachea come together rather than up, up further in, along the, the line. Yeah. 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 Um, and and it, it's a fascinating, you said uh, another thing, a lot of birds, uh, a lot of people think that the birds do everything by instinct, but, but they have to learn their, their songs. They and you said that they, even the baby birds, uh, the songbirds, do the equivalent of babbling. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it, 
there's so many interesting things about birds. So there's a whole chapter on, on, on right. bird songs. Um, you know, first of all, it's, it's mostly the male birds that sing and it's the female birds that choose. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, it, it, interesting there. And um, the, the, the birds learn their song. So a, a, a male baby bird learns the song from his daddy. And um, if he is, uh, if he is subjected to a an impoverished song, um, he will learn an impoverished song, and that will not help him. Um, and, and similarly, you know, as with with humans and languages, um, the, the 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 daddy bird will speak the the language and the dialect of that particular kind of bird, which then is going to be imparted to uh, the next generation and the sounds of these calls then uh, enable the birds to of different species, for example, to mm -hmm. recognize each other. Um, and it, and it's, it's kind of interesting again, how, um, you know, birds who speak different dialects of the same language, you know, the female bird is not going to be as ready to mate with a bird that speaks um, a dialect that that she's not familiar with, mm -hmm. um, even if it's from the same species. So you know, I think that it tells us something about how our experience um, really uh, shapes our our preferences and choices, and and how applicable some of their experiences are to our own experiences, and and how our educational system is set up. And you have lots and lots of connections in your book. So we've been discussing Of Sound Mind uh, by Nina Kraus. Um, and uh, so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club and it's 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again, Nina. That was a great discussion. Thank you. Great questions.